It's a skirmish on the high seas that also perhaps tells a tale of Brexit, the press calling it the scallop war, the 15-year-old fisherman's feud between French and uh, British, which uh, this week flared up spectacularly off the estuary of the Seine in the English Channel. The frustrated French claim the larger UK vessels are plundering the seabed during a mating season for scallops where they themselves refrain from trawling what we here call Coquille Saint-Jacques prized mollusks that are then sold back to the French. We're going to be talking territorial waters, sustainable fishing, and yes, we will talk Brexit. Will the fishermen who voted in high numbers to leave the European Union be better off once they are out? Whose job will it be to oversee the high seas? And how to chart uh, how we meet our growing demand for fish without driving them into extinction? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the scallop war. And uh, joining us from Fontainebleau outside of Paris, Christian Lequen, who teaches at the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po. Thank you for joining us. And from Montau in the south of France, Scottish environmental activist Alistair McIntosh. His books include Poacher's Pilgrimage and Island Journey. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Now you could quip that it's all part of a 900-year-old cross-channel rivalry, but it was no laughing matter for those involved. Claire Mufson has the story. It's a scene worthy of a naval battle. Filmed from a French trawler, these French fishermen throw rocks before getting rammed by their target, an English boat. Early Tuesday morning, around 40 Norman fishing boats set out to confront their English counterparts. The tension mounted quickly as they hurled insults and threw flares at each other. It went on for several hours, damaging three boats before the police arrived. The situation ended when English boats retreated and left the area. In the end, it paid off because they left. They left, but they got more than 20,000 scallops. As my colleagues have said, we won the battle, but we haven't won the war. It's a recurring conflict. For years, French fishermen have denounced what they call a summer pillage in the Baie de Seine, a French coastal region. There, British boats can legally fish year-round, but the French must wait until October 1st. They're concerned about overfishing and the impact on their business. On Tuesday night, the British Federation of Fishermen called for calm and negotiations. So, Christian Lequen, this is a 15-year-old argument uh, that it appeared had been smoothed over a couple of years back. Why is it flaring up? Well, um... We, we, we had problems uh, uh, like this between the French and the um, uh, British fishermen in the past, but not in the last uh, 30 years. So probably the reason uh, why we have uh, tensions today um, are the following. First of all, it's scallops. And scallops, uh, well, it's, it's a high-value product. So uh, there is a big competition, and as it has been, uh, uh, it was said in your um, uh, 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 report, um, uh, most of the scallops w which are fished by uh, British uh, fishermen, they are sold back uh, to France. So this is probably one, one, one reason. And the second reason is, uh, well, the tension in the perspective of Brexit. 50% uh, um, of, the, of the catches uh, which are done now by the uh, French fishermen are done in the British waters. And, uh, of course, they don't know what uh, the situation will be uh, after March 2019. So um, it's, it, it's not a particularly peaceful milieu, you know, the fishermen. When, uh, when there is a problem, uh, well, uh, they have a capacity immediately to, uh, to react with a certain uh, violence. And uh, uh, I think the two reasons explain why we had this uh, 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 tension uh, again after 30 years of uh, uh, peaceful relations. And, and uh, just to remind our viewers, Christian Lequen, uh, the British vessels 
are bigger than the French ones in, that we saw. Uh, but the French trawlers outnumbered the British in the incident that took place the other night. Yes, uh, in, in in general, that's true. The the, the British vessels are are uh, bigger than the French, but we we have much more French vessels than uh, than uh, British vessels. Well, um, the, the 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 British fishermen didn't do anything illegal. You know, um, they are perfectly. Um, um, uh, allowed to 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 fish, but what I understood is that there was a sort of uh, well informal code uh, uh, in the past which said that they didn't start before the French because the French they can only fish uh, between the first of October and uh, and the fifteenth of May. So this year. The, the, the British um, uh, fishermen decided not to respect this informal code. But again, this is not illegal if uh, uh, we uh, consider uh, law. Um, this is something they were allowed to do, you know. Um, yeah, and among the reactions, the European Commission reminds all parties involved that scallops fishing fishery is regulated at the national level inviting all parties to find an amicable solution, quote, as has been done in the past. Let's now hear from Michael Gove. He's the UK's high-profile pro-Brexit environment minister. My heart goes out to the fishermen who were caught up in the, the terrible scenes that we saw that happened earlier this week. And my sympathies are entirely with them. They were fishing entirely legally. They have every right to be in those waters. And we've talked to the French authorities in order to ensure that we have appropriate policing. These are French waters. It's the responsibility of the French to ensure that those who have a legal right to fish can continue to fish uninterrupted. Alistair McIntosh, do you agree with Michael Gove? I didn't. I sadly did not. I'm ashamed of what the British Environment Minister is saying there. He's correct. Right, we seem to be having. The a, 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 I'm going to interrupt right. you, Alistair. Unfortunately, we seem to be having a, a sound issue there. Let's see if we can reconnect with you, Alistair McIntosh. You agree with with Michael Gove? I do not agree with Michael Gove. I think that many British people would be ashamed by what he is saying as the environment minister, because while he is correct that the French have got a legal right to be fishing there, there has been a common management policy exercised in the past so that there can be wiser, sustainable management. And that, to my shame, is currently being overridden by British scallop fishers. It's being overridden by uh, British uh, scallop fishers. Uh we uh, are, are, were, are unfortunately unsuccessful in joining uh, UK skipper Aaron Brown, the founder of Fishing for Leave. Uh, his argument on, on this issue is that uh, all this is done uh, within the law. It is within the law, but you see what the French are trying to do is they are trying to improve the management standards of the fishery by having a code of practice for not fishing in the summer. Now, why is summertime important? Summertime is important because that is when the scallops release their spat. That is when the scallop releases its eggs and sperm so that the species can reproduce. Now, the French are respecting that way of managing the fisheries. The British are not respecting it. Therefore, the British are taking advantage of the fact that the French are trying to manage the fishery in a more sustainable manner. And that is bad relationships. It's not illegal relationships, but it is bad relationships between our two fishing communities. Uh, coverage of uh, what happened uh, has been, of course, different according to whether or not you're pro-leave or pro-remain or whether you're French or, or you're British. Um, the French putting the accent on the size of the boats, uh, one of those uh, three ships, the Honeybourne uh, Three, uh, owned by uh, one of these big companies that controls, what, nearly a quarter of uh, all the fishing rights uh, in the UK. The UK putting the accent on the fact that 60% uh, of the fish that are um, harvested in UK waters are done so by European fishermen from the continent. That's correct. I mean, the European fishermen take a lot more scallops from British waters than British fishermen take from French waters. That's the way the common fisheries policy works. 
However, the important thing is we should all try to manage the fisheries more sustainably. That is what the British are not doing. Now, if you take the Scottish fishery and the Honeybourne 3 is a Scottish-owned vessel owned by Macduff's, which in turn is a company, I understand, owned by the Canadians. That is one Scottish boat that has caused conflict with the French. I can tell you that many people in Scotland are very angry and ashamed of that. We are angry and ashamed of it because we sell 500 million euros worth of fish to the French market every year. We voted 62% against Brexit in Scotland. We are being forced into Brexit against our will. And we are concerned that French people doing their shopping will be looking at that and they will be perhaps not buying as much Scottish fish as they might do and the rest of our fishermen will be suffering. And that is why we do not, many of us do not agree with Michael Grove and we want to see the British government get this sorted out so that we have an entente cordiale with our French friends. Christian Lequen, your thoughts? Well, I, I, I fully Sorry? understand and support. I, I fully understand and support what was uh, what was said. Uh, um, I would like to come back on this question of legal or, or, or illegal. Uh, um, well, it, it is legal, but it is not sustainable what the British uh, uh, fishermen are doing. And this is what has to be understood. Uh, beyond the law, you have a certain number of informal code to uh, make the stocks uh, uh, sustainable, and that's true. That was more respected by the by the French than it is now by the by the British uh, uh, fishermen. But what has been said uh, about the the market issues is absolutely crucial, and I can understand the point of view of uh, of a, a, a representative of uh, the Scottish fisherman or somebody from Scotland. Most of the stocks, uh, which are um, of the catches, um, which uh, are taken by British uh, um, vessels, including Scottish vessels, well, they are sold in the EU, they are sold outside the, the UK. So the perspective of, of Brexit is not particularly uh, uh, rosy, is not particularly uh, uh, optimistic for uh, the, the, the Scottish and the English uh, fishermen in terms of market. Uh, and this is something uh, fishing for leave, of course, is never saying. And on the hashtag F24Debate, uh, a reaction to uh, the clip we heard uh, from Environment Minister Michael Gove, a Brexiteer again, saying Gove should intervene by insisting that British trawlers abide by local conservation practices and adopt sustainable fishing methods. We need to protect the seabed, not destroy it in a fit of brexit fueled uh, petulance. Uh, Alistair McIntosh, just remind us, why did so many fishermen vote for Brexit? Well, you know, <laughs> why did the Turkeys vote for Brexit when the rich farmer told them to? My, my belief is that the, the fishermen were persuaded that by voting for Brexit, they would get bigger access to their own fisheries resource. But nobody ever said anything to them about the markets. Nobody ever said anything that mm. Brexit would mean they would have to pay an EU tariff, that there might be difficulties in getting their produce to the market if there are delays because we no longer have free movement at customs posts. And I can tell you, in my part of the world, which is the Outer Hebrides of Scotland, the Isle of Lewis, where I'm from, there are many shellfish companies very worried just now that Brexit might drive them out of business because they won't be able to get their market, their product to the market. And if they do get it to the market, they'll be hit by tariffs. So that is why, you know, in Scotland, we voted 62% against Brexit. We don't want it. The latest opinion poll in Scotland showed that two thirds of the Scottish people are opposed to Brexit. And when we come back, we'll be uh, asking uh, Skipper Aaron Brown, the founder of uh, Fishing for Leave, what he thinks of it all. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate.
Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. Now, earlier this week, uh, we had uh, trawlers crossing swords uh, in uh, uh, off the waters of France, French and uh, British uh, vessels. Uh, this over uh, the uh, fishing of scallops, Cookie Saint-Jacques, as we call them here, uh, here to talk about it with us. Uh, Skipper Aaron Brown, the founder of uh, Fishing for Leave. Welcome back to the show. Christian Lequen, who teaches at Sciences Po, the French, French Political Science Institute. He's in Fontainebleau, outside of the French capital. And joining us from the south of France, near Montpellier, Alistair McIntosh. His books include Poacher's Pilgrimage, An Island uh, Journey, uh, Environmental Activist. Um, so the, the incident, just to remind our viewers once again, took place uh, near the mouth of of the River Seine uh, in the English Channel, inside of uh, French uh, territorial waters. As uh, the UK Environment Minister said, it's legal uh, for those uh, ships to be there in uh, French waters. Uh, there are bilateral rules that regulate uh, the seas between the, the Fran France uh, and the UK. However, Aaron Brown, we were discussing it in part one of our show, it's mating season, and the French in particular taking exception to those bigger boats, in particular the one we were talking about earlier, the Honeyborn 3, that uh, trawl, that rake the ocean, they say. Your, your, your reaction to that? Well, our reaction to it has been quite unequivocal, but um, firstly, um, the, the level of violence and intimidation deployed and premeditatedly deployed because there was TV crews there who had obviously been scheduled is, is unacceptable from the, the sheer point of view of navigation. On top of that, it's entirely hypocritical because what people need to remember is that for 40 years now, due to the common fisheries policy, um, France in particular has received 90% of the share of stocks in the English Channel and under equal access to a common resource, is able to fish up to six miles from the beach. And a fleet of French boats predominantly do around it, the southwest in Cornwall. So for the French to kick off to the manner they have over a few British boats, exercising their right under, under common EU policy to fish there is entirely hypocritical. And in addition to that, perhaps if France and the EU hadn't robbed British fishermen of our own resources and our side of the channel, then we wouldn't have to be pursuing scallops nomadically. Um, yep. over towards the French put, put, side. So our fleet was put, there put legally, yourself, and, and the French really need to pull their neck in. Put, put yourself in the shoes of those French fishermen. They're small uh, fishermen, and they say, you know, we're not allowed to fish for those scallops because it's mating season. Why are the British here? Well, the British weren't into the closed box. The British were outside the 12 mile, legally fishing, as has been stated uh, even by, by, by the British government. Um, what the French have tried to do, and, and one can't fault them in some way, although um, the degree uh, that they went to was, was far too extreme of trying to, to, to stick up for themselves. But as I say, put yourself in our shoes. For 40 years now, we've seen our fleet, half our fleet scrap through decommissioning schemes because the EU has been catching 60% of the fish in our waters. If you look at the, the share out of the internationally agreed TACs that the EU agrees uh, on our behalf. We provide 50% of the waters and 60% of the catches to the pot, but we only get 25% of the TAC. So, so how do you how do you see really the rules actually be kicking off? It's British. How do you see the rules after Brexit? What do you want to see be the the, the rules when it comes to who can fish where? Well, we want to see what was voted for, and that's to leave and, and leave unequivocally, not some half in, half out um, Brexit and name only as proposed at Checkers. Now, what that would allow us to do um, is revert immediately to international law under UNCLOS. Um, British waters and resources would come out the common EU pot, which I think is perhaps more what the French fishermen are worried about deep down. And what that then allows us to do is to have um, fair shares based on the predominance of fish in our waters. Instead of 90% to the, the EU and 10% to us, it would more be 70-30 um, in our favour. And we revert to international law, and that allows us to manage our own resources in a far better manner than the, the disastrous common fisheries policy. Christian Leiken, do you see that happening? 
Well, I, I, I think the, what has been said about uh, catches by uh, EU fishermen in the British waters, of course, is right. But um, uh, it's a bit, uh, how can I say that, it's a bit short. Uh, just to consider uh, fishery, uh, um, well, uh, issues um, in the perspective of catches. Um, fishery is also about market, is also about trade. And uh, uh, most of the products uh, which are uh, fish by British uh, fishermen are sold in the EU without any duty, without any tax, because of the EU single market. So um, we can say that the British fishermen also benefited a lot uh, of the uh, marketing aspect uh, of the single market um, and uh, uh, we don't have to limit the question of fishery only to the question of catches. This is what uh, the gentleman who spoke did and I think uh, it's, uh, it's a mistake. So what do you, but do you agree with Aaron Brown that well after Brexit we should just have uh, revert to international law when it comes to who gets to fish where? Well, after well, Brexit, absolutely. we, uh, the, of course... The Christian Leken, let me hear your reaction. Um, after Brexit, that's true, because um, uh, uh, Great Britain will become, a, 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 well, a third state for the EU. Um, it's the international law uh, which uh, uh, will be available. Uh, but it means that everything will have to be negotiated uh, by the British government with the different uh, uh, states uh, of, uh, of Europe on a bilateral basis also. And um, I'm not sure that that would be m more beneficial at the end, you know, uh, for the British uh, fishermen. But nobody knows about that because all this negotiation have to be done and the agreement have to be uh, reached and, and, and signed. It's not the case for the moment. For the moment, it's the common foreign um, uh, the, the common fishery policy, which is ruling uh, the uh, relationships between the, the Could, British fishermen and the other fishermen in the EU. Aaron Brown, are you worried uh, that, uh, well, it's going to be more expensive to export fish to the continent You'll, because uh, you won't have free trade anymore? There'll be tariffs. Well, well, firstly, there's nothing to negotiate in terms of waters because by right of international law, as he did admit, there are waters and our resources, just as Norway, Iceland and Faroe, and we will quite happily sit down and agree any uh, future reciprocal agreements on a needs must equal barter basis, but not on the punishingly unfair shares as now. But to come to the markets, the thing all everybody misses, your, your gentleman there in France uh, and others, is that you need to actually be able to catch the fish before you can sell it. There's no point in saying you have a wonderful market if you're only allowed to catch 10% of the fish that you should be able to. And the other thing that they miss as well is market demand. Now, at the end of the day just now, there's already a big demand for a quality product by consumers in the European Union. And when the European fleet loses the ability to pillage 60% of the fish from our waters, they're going to need our resources more than ever. And coming to the tariffs, just to look at it purely economically, even if the EU imposed the hardest tariffs it could under WTO terms, what we would pay in tariffs would be more than compensated for by the level of resources that we would repatriate. So just in a pure balance sheet of what we gain by what we could possibly um, be impeded by, it's, it, it's, it's a no-brainer. On top of that, is the EU going to, to, to um, um, spite its consumers, its processors, its distributors, its supermarkets of, of what is part of the staple diet? I doubt it, but if they did, there's a global market out there with global demand. Alistair McIntosh, you agree? Well, I think what's being missed from this debate is that Brexit has, in effect, weaponized what was previously a common management policy that was managing this fishery resource in a sustainable way. What we're seeing here is the poison of Brexit playing into our fisheries and polarizing different communities of fishers and consumers. And as I say, the worry is. Well, I'm that this sorry, will I've, lead I've, 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 I've got to put in there and disagree. I've got to. I've, I've, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You can't. You can't bring in. You. You. You very much sound like a kind of on, SNP fall, fellow traveller with an axe to grind. I, I'm sorry. You mentioned well, earlier the Western about, Isles. I'm I spoke about with the, the head of the Western I'm Isles. I'm concerned about the Scottish position here. Well, it's not I'm a sorry? Scottish position because you mentioned the Western Isles. I spoke. 
I spoke only four days ago with Duncan McInnes, the head of the Western Isles Fishermen's Association. It actually represents the fishermen, and they and their membership are not worried in any way, shape, nor form about any tariffs or any customs uh, uh, um, slowdown at customs. It's not going to be something well, that, that affects is, us that, grievously. That, that we managed I mean, before. Duncan, we'll manage Duncan again. has his own view on these. So that Duncan has his own view on things, but that is not the view that the Scottish government. Well, Duncan has Scottish a view of his members. Is very well, concerned but, 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 about how, but, but, how the Scottish Duncan government is is totally My main point. To my main point. Look, look, can I say? Look, you you interrupted me. You interrupted me. Can I say the main concern here is that here is a sensible management policy being implemented by the French. The British, by not respecting that, are taking from the French the advantage of that sensible management policy. And that is a very dangerous thing to be doing when we are trying to negotiate whatever is or is not going to happen with Brexit. All right. The, the, the... Well, if it's a sensible management policy, is it not a sensible management policy or not what it was imposed upon us, where the French and the other EU fleet has benefited from the eradication of the British industry? So these booming stocks we have where the British fleet's been wiped out are being taken advantage of by, by, by the French and the, and the EU fleet. So it's not a policy. It might be the view of the Scottish government, who you seem to support, but they're in direct conflict with the Scottish industry. We want out. We want out entirely. And you mentioned, you, you keep coming back to it, this is a good policy. How is it a good policy, the common fisheries policy, where a million tonnes of fish are discarded annually? Fishermen are forced to catch and discard twice well, of well, you, you know, you, you know, you, 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 you know yourself that there has been, you know yourself that huge steps have been taken in recent years to reduce the discards problem. But the bottom line issue here, the bottom line issue here is that the French are trying to upgrade the sustainability of the fishery. The British are cutting across it. It is very sad that that is being used for a Brexit battlefield. All right, let, let's talk about this issue because you, you touch on an important point here, which is uh, sustainable uh, fishing looking ahead. And by the way, uh, in the name of balance, uh, the anger of the French fishermen is not always directed at the British. Uh, back in January, they blockaded the northern city of Calais, halting shipping movement at France's busiest passenger port with a protest aimed not at the British, but at the Dutch and the losses inflicted by the practice of electric pulse fishing, which the European Parliament yeah. wants banned, but uh, which has yet to be completely sure. eradicated. Uh, the European Commission, more broadly, it's set 2020 as the year it wants to end overfishing across its waters. As a study published at the start of the year by the Pew Charitable Trust shows, that's going to be a very hard target to meet. Uh, once Brexit happens, and I'll begin with you, Alistair McIntosh, uh, is that going to help or hurt in the fight to end overfishing in European waters? <laughs> it depends what kind of a government the British impose upon, certainly on Scottish waters. But what I would like to say here about this, about the overfishing, is that scallop dredging is a particularly damaging form of fishing. All right, we seem to have lost the connection. We seem to have lo lost the connection there with Alistair McIntosh. We'll try to, to, uh, to, to reconnect. Christian Leken, your, your thoughts on this about uh, overfishing. Is Brexit going to make it easier or, or harder? No, I, I don't think we really have a, a, a big uh, uh, effect on uh, on this question of overfishing. Uh, this question of overfishing uh, uh, has nothing to do with institution. It has to do with the uh, um, practices of the of the of the fisherman. And uh, in this case of scallops, uh, um, well, we could see that uh, uh, the arguments from uh, from uh, the representative of the of the, of, the, of the British. Uh, 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 fishermen in this uh, in this debate were absolutely clear. Well, sustainability is uh, is not an issue. What is important for him is uh, well having the right to fish or not. Well, if we continue with that uh, in uh, uh, the um, context of, uh, of, uh, of 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 Great Britain, well, uh, uh, of course they will have a big problem uh, with the sustainability of the stocks even in the British waters. So uh, I'm not. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced that uh, 
Brexit is going to solve this problem of overfishing. Not at all. Uh, Aaron Brown, uh, uh, you won't have Brussels on your back after, after uh, Brexit, uh, but uh, how will you self-regulate when it comes to stopping overfishing? Well, well it's, it, the thing the gentleman misses there is what we are complaining about just now is not that we want more fish taken out of the sea, it's who's taking it as a problem. So we are not saying we want an automatic increase in the amount of biomass harvested out of the sea. Quite the opposite. We've actually developed policy, which I'll come to, that could reduce it, whilst giving a more profitable industry. What we are saying is if there's 100,000 tonnes of fish there to catch, for a figure, say, that rather than the French taking 90,000 tonnes and we get 10,000, we still take 100,000 tonnes out of the sea, but we actually get a fair share under international law, which rightfully ours. Now, coming to the sustainability, Britain could actually do better, right? A policy that the EU has imposed has been a quota system. This doesn't involve scallops. This is a wider fishery. And under a quota system, that is, ask, is the system itself that has caused discarding. It's caused discard. Uh, Christian, yes, let's go for it. Yes. What, does it mean that you're in favour of uh, everybody fishing in its own national waters? This is this is what you have in mind: the British fishermen fishing in the British waters, the French in the French waters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Is it is it your model for the future? Well, yes, because Iceland catches over ninety percent of the fish in its waters. Norway does the same, and so does Faroe. So why shouldn't Britain? But Britain does that for what we lose in a little bit of scallops in the Seine Bay, some hake out the Jones and Labadee Bank and various other bits of pieces. We lose 100,000 tonnes of resources, but we regain seven, 750,000. So it's usually to our advantage. But just to come back to the sustainability after answering your question, the EU system of quotas forces fishermen to discard to find what they can keep. It's impossible to set quotas, uh, uh, arbitrary targets, precisely enough to match the fluctuations that are going on at sea. So as we've all seen, there's been discarding. The EU bringing in the discard ban that is to be enforced as of 2019 addresses the discard symptom, not the policy cause. So what we are wanting to see with Brexit, when we're free of the CFP and can manage our own waters, is a system of effort control. And what will happen then is rather than boats fishing 24-7, 300 days a year, um, trying to find what they can keep and discarding all the time, they will be limited in the amount of time they have at sea, so they will catch less, but they will be able to land all catches and return for, for, for being limited in time at sea. And what that will give you, unlike now, where nobody knows what's sustainable or not because the science is so accurate, inaccurate because we're dumping fish all the time, what that will do is it will give science buying up-to-date, real-time data, and off of that they'll be able to pursue real-time management. So it's not only a case of just getting the resources back, it's husbanding husbanding our resources in a far better manner to have a profitable industry, but most important, to have a sustainable marine environment that can support our coastal communities for generations to come. Very briefly, because we're running short on time, Christian Leiken. Well, I'm, 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 I think this is, a, this is a very protectionist model, which, uh, uh, of course, uh, forget one important thing, is that uh, currently there are some British fishermen who are also fishing outside the British waters. So uh, if you uh, decide to implement such a protectionist model in, uh, in the UK waters, of course, you will have no reciprocity. And uh, that would be a disadvantage for a certain number of fishermen who are fishing in the Belgian waters, French waters, Dutch waters, etc., etc. So and at the end, I think that... And at the end, the, the British, will, the British will, will, will lose out. Alistair McIntosh, your final word on this. Hello, yes, I'm back again with you. Yeah, your, your final word on this, on, sorry, on, on, the, on, 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 on sustainable fishing going forward. Okay, so what I would like to say about scallop dredging is that it's a particularly damaging way of fishing for the seabed. It involves dragging with chains, a heavy contraction with spikes across the seabed, which damages all manner of sea life. It pulls the legs of crabs, it rips starfish apart. If you are going to have that kind of fishery, you've got to manage it as sustainably as possible. You've got to try and manage it to marine stewardship levels of blue label so that you rest the fishery, you allow the spawning to take place. And this is all that the French are trying to do. They're just trying to upgrade the act, 
ideally, I would say, you wouldn't have scallop perching at all. You would do it all by diving, like we used to do when I was a boy. That's not the way most of the industry goes today, but it's what we should be working to, whether Brexit happens or not. All right, and we'll have to leave it there. I want to thank you so much, Alistair McIntosh, uh, for joining us from the south of France. Christian Lequen from Fontainebleau. Aaron Brown from the North Sea. Well, thank you for joining us. Stay with us. Our Media Watch segment Go is call. next. And we say hello to Emma James. Hi, it's fascinating Hi. how the scallop war and Brexit are intertwined. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And because of the images that we've seen, it's unsurprising really that we're seeing words like battle and war being used over and over again in headlines and in people's social media comments. Uh, this one from France Trois, the regional uh, television outlet here that uh, covers Normandy in particular, has gone with uh, this headline saying that the battle over the scallops, um, why has it gone so far? Um, not everyone is taking this terribly seriously though. It always happens on social media that people will make light of the most serious issues. Um, this gentleman going for a bit of a tongue twister effect. England v France, someone is being selfish about shellfish in order to sell fish. I didn't practice that one. I think I did quite someone well there. Someone is being selfish about <laughs> shellfish. Absolutely. Lots of people making jokes on uh, online, including this one. That to let the British cook these scallops would be an offence, maybe a crime that should be judged in front of an international court. That's a French Twitter user, I should point out, um, because, of course, the Brits uh, have rather embraced the idea of scallops in recent years. How Not do they prepare their cookie Saint-Jacques? I don't know. I've never eaten one in my life. <laughs> I don't really do oh, see missing food. out. Oh, OK. <laughs> maybe I'll give it a try one day. Um, Interestingly, though, even some journalists have taken a very strange look at this one. This from the Washington Examiner. Scallop wars aside, uh, Britain would defeat France in a naval battle for the English Channel. Right. It's a very, very odd article. Um, and some people just really don't understand quite where this has no, come from. Especially uh, since it's... France and Britain are the two closest allies in the Navy. Anyway. Absolutely. Uh, this person saying that feeling when people forget the Napoleonic Wars ended uh, over 200 years ago. Uh, it does seem a very strange uh, line to take because there are so many serious issues that you can talk about with this particular story. The Guardian probably, I think, explains it best in, in a fairly sort of short, easy to read uh, section uh, written by John Litchfield. And they, he points out that this goes much deeper than just Brexit with nets. It isn't just about uh, fishing rights and the EU and whether or not the UK is within the EU. Um, it's an age-old row, basically, and he points out that similar incidents have been happening for the last 15 years, or arguably, you could say, for the last 900 years. Um, the UK, of course, the irony with all this has been claiming for years that the EU's fishermen are plundering their waters, and now, of course, the it's the shoes on the other foot, as it were. Um, La Baie de Seine is 12 well, there were 12 miles off the coast of uh, La Baie, in La Baie de Seine. Um, and of course, the French are stopped from g gathering those scallops there by French law. Because it's mating season. Exactly. And it's EU law that gives the British the right to be there. Now, what this article points out is that French fishermen say that these large boats that the uh, British have, with heavier dredging tackle, are capable of hoovering up enough scallops in one day to keep local fishermen in work for a month. And that really goes to the heart of why the French and those fishermen in Normandy are so upset about this. And of course, as our guest was just saying, there are the environmental concerns too because it's somewhat disputed exactly what state it leaves the seabed in, but the French fishermen say it leaves it like a ploughed field. So it is hard to see how that is a sustainable way to treat that particular patch of seabed. And it comes at a time where we're eating more and more fish. Absolutely. Despite all the plastic in the water and the fact that we know that the fish are eating a lot of this plastic and it's actually ending up inside us, uh, seafood does seem to be on the rise. You've only got to walk down any high street, whether it's in France or the United Kingdom, there are seafood restaurants everywhere. Uh, lots of people reacting to this, and not all of them have sympathy with the British fishermen, or this particular woman talking about the Scottish fishermen involved. Uh, you may have UK law on your side, but you're morally in the wrong in your, your dispute with the French. If the roles were reversed, you would be going berserk, and I think that's probably fair to say. Um, this gentleman as well saying, the French are trying to abide by the rules and protect the seabed and their livings. There's a good chance 
that the catch of the UK boats will be sold on and you won't even see it for sale in the United Kingdom. Some people are a bit sceptical, though, as to whether or not the French really are trying to protect anything much here. Um, those were French fishermen uh, were salty. Uh, that's a sort of a colloquial term for angry, um, that the Brits had a head start on the catch. They are not eco-warriors. Now, we don't know what their primary um, aim is to achieve here, but they are protecting their livelihoods. And if, if it's a byproduct, certainly they are concerned about the ecology and the environment as well. Uh, but this gentleman saying if they could fish all year round, then they would. Um, what's interesting to note, though, uh, Parry Match uh, republishing this article from 2016 to show that this issue isn't a recent one. Mm. It's been happening for many years. And uh, in this article, they talk to a fisherman who says he has a quota to pick up two tons of these scallops. Um, it used to take him just 12 hours to reach his quota. Now it takes him 36 because it takes him so much longer to find them. And he's blaming those depleted stocks on the English and Irish fishing crews. So it's a long-standing problem. Nobody really knows quite how Brexit is going to affect it all. It was certainly making both sides salty. <laughs> Many thanks uh, for that, Emma James. We want to thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.